On December 2, 2020, at the peak of Uganda's elections, the Ugandan government froze the bank accounts of two NGOs. This was on the orders of the executive director of the Financial Intelligence Authority, Sidney Asubo, over allegations of terrorism financing. This decision was revoked and the accounts of the NGOs were unfrozen after several pleas from the NGOs and investigations. On 4th February 2021, Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni ordered the suspension of the Democratic Governance Facility, an entity that was providing both financial and technical support to both the state and non-state actors, including NGOs. President Museveni said that the DGF funds were used to finance activities and organizations designed to subvert the government under the guise of improving governance. On 20th August 2021, the Ugandan government suspended the operations of 54 non-government organizations due to non-compliance with the NGO Act 2016. According to the National Bureau for NGOs, 23 NGOs were operating with expired permits, 15 NGOs had failed to file annual returns and audited books of accounts to the NGO Bureau, and 16 NGOs were operating without registration with the NGO Bureau. The move was described by many in the civic space as a clampdown on civil society organizations in the space of human rights, good governance, and democracy. So, is the government of Uganda using its legal and policy framework to chalk civil society organizations and NGOs? And if so, why? Do NGOs pose a threat to President Museveni's leadership? Welcome to the Deep Dive. Among the NGOs that were indefinitely suspended by the NGO Bureau was the Citizens' Coalition for Electoral Democracy in Uganda, SEDU. SEDU was established on August 19, 2009 as a broad coalition that brings together over 800 like-minded civil society organizations and over 8,000 individuals to advocate for electoral democracy in Uganda. The organization was at the forefront of advocating for electoral reforms, transparency and integrity of elections, and citizen participation in democratic processes through several campaigns. Charity Ayimbisiwe was the executive director at the time. She says that the indefinite suspension of SEDU was the epitome of a rift between the organization and the state. About uh, four or five years ago, SEDU began it was actually precisely 2019, January 2019. Um, after the uh, LC1 elections, Sedu went on air and said the elections that had been conducted were a sham. I was the one that represented Sedu at the time and what NBS, and I said the elections were a sham. A sham because of the malpractices witnessed during the elections. This, she says, was documented in their observation report. Being unhappy about it, we did document and we raised the issue with the Electoral Commission. So come 2021, already the relationship had been severed. They were not sure how we were going to assess the process. They had their own mindset on what they wanted us to assess the process like, but SEDU could not leave that billing because our document says we want to promote electoral democracy. That is the document of SEDU. That is what it used to say. During the 2021 Uganda election, SEDU was not given accreditation as election observers, but rather as election sensitizers. However, SEDU made several observations which they documented in a report. So a lot of intimidation. We saw people dying, 54 people died on the street. It was meant to cause fear. And SEDU documented these things and put them out, which did not augur well electoral commission. SEDU was then summoned by the NGO Bureau to explain why they released a report on election monitoring when they were only accredited to provide voter sensitization. In that election report, what we did with the report is ordinary election observation work. We caught the results as had been produced by the Electoral Commission and we tallied 
every polling station and we happened to find that President Museveni had been voted 100% at 192 polling stations. Most certainly the 2021 electoral process was one that closed out citizens more than ever. Sedu gave a legal justification for releasing the report, but this too was not convincing enough. That meeting that was initially called at NGO Bureau raised the fundamental issue. Sedu was not supposed to be an observer. And we raised the constitutional right. That Article 59 allows every Ugandan to participate in an election as a voter or as a participant. And Sedu had chosen to be a participant. But we also raised the national objective on the principles of democracy, which is, I think, principle number three, where uh, the state says one of its principal issues is to allow citizens to participate in the governance of their country. Governance of the country, they choose the leader they want. They participate entirely in the process. So we said when we went to this process, we went as citizens of Uganda. But why did Sedu? operate without a renewed license. Sedu had gone on what we called a fact-finding mission. We wanted to find out the facts. What was happening on the ground? Were people free? Were people voting? We said a lot of military. It is another issue we raised. We said the military had taken over almost all polling stations. They closed out party agents. Those were part of the issues that we were raising in our report. And those were the issues that we were raising at the time of election. And we called out government on the question of violence and the people that were disappearing. And there were young people. We were doing a voter mobilization campaign telling young people it is safe, participate. And on the other hand, the young people were disappearing. So it was getting frustrating on that front. For now, the SEDU remains closed. They said the condition to lift the suspension of SEDU, which was instituted on the 20th day of August. 2021 was we sit down with the Electoral Commission, have a conversation with them, and if they're happy to let us go, the Bureau would release us. We found that a weird condition because SEDU is an independent entity of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission is its own body, but SEDU was also an independent organization. And we raised that with the uh, NGO Bureau, and we said for us, we are registered with you as an entity. SEDU has since closed its office for nearly two years. Charity in Bisiwe has since moved on to another organization still in the electoral democracy space. What it means for civic space is that the space has completely or, or is closing um, and didn't start with just this. If you noticed, there were organizations that had been closed before, like Bliss, and it's back on the list this time around with SEDU. Uh, what happens with democracy? It is a struggle for space. So every time you secede some little space, government pushes more. You secede, they push more. Even what was happening with civil society organizations in the time SEDU was suspended, those 20 or so organizations that were suspended, government was testing the waters to see what is civil society going to do. But civil society decided to go silent. They decided to lobby on individual levels and have conversations in small spaces. SEDU had intended to lead uh, the team through the UN and advocate using the UN arm because the UN arm was willing to support the NGOs. And we had conversations with different NGOs and they said, ah, look, no, 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 I don't think we can come on board because our issues are different. We have, for us, we have not even made our papers clear. For us, we have not registered for us. So everybody had an excuse. She, however, says that she was disappointed at the division within civil society organizations that refused to unite and fight back against the closure of the 54 NGOs. Now, every time civil society cannot coalesce around an issue that is oppressing them, then you know the space is completely going to close because government will always protect its interest, always. Civil society is supposed to be a body that pushes back 
and fights advocates for rights, supposed to stand firm in the face of adversity. Every time you withdraw in the face of adversity, then be sure that space has been seceded to the one that wanted it. While SEDU remains closed, Chapter 4 Uganda, a human rights organization which was closed, rushed to court to have their suspension lifted. After several months, court found the decision by the NGO Bureau to close the organization was irregular. Chapter 4 has since the court ruling reopened and is back to business. Peter Magera is a lawyer with Chapter 4 Uganda. He says that government was targeting those in the human rights and good governance space. On this side, the government, of course, moved to control the NGOs. And uh, at this stage, we should note that whereas the most vocal are the NGOs in governance, the real effect uh, has been across. The 300 plus NGOs so far affected, uh, over 50% are in governance. So one would say, yes, you are targeting governance. You see, when the NGO Bureau, for example, accuses an NGO of not submitting particular documents, it's not that that NGO hasn't submitted those documents. Sometimes those documents are even on their website <laughs> that the organization submitted. Those particular organizations are thought to be supporting maybe the, the other side of politics. Magela says that government has its fears and rushes into making such decisions to protect its stay in power. I think right now our systems are such that after government has put the opposition where it is right now, we don't have so much a strong opposition, the next line of opposition is seen to be NGOs. Uh, and so if you make a law that political parties cannot be funded externally, they have to find money from local sources, and you also make a law that as government you will fund political parties, but you never fund them. So the next time you see political parties doing an activity, your suspicion is probably they are getting this money from NGOs. If you are human rights and you are going to document police uh, brutality um, in a demonstration, so you are likely to be closed. If you are human rights and you are going to be documenting um, some corruption cases, you are going to be closed. Or they will put something on you and uh, come for you. If you are just silent, you are operating a church and people go and pray and say nothing, you will be fine. According to Magela, this is buttressed by the fact that the closures come during political times. All this civic space narrowing, all those cases I've told you about, happen when there is a major political event. Either an amendment to a certain law which government wants so much, you can trace this to as back as um, the times of amending the land law or making the land law 1998 around there. Either there is a major law that government has interest in it, whether it was the oil laws, the NGO law, the Toji Kwatako campaign, which was a removing of uh, age limit, or the, the previous one of removing of the term limits, it's normally that. Or there is an election, like you know, we had an election last year, so you have this whole bunch of NGOs having this, uh, this problem. More often than not, the state targets those who have not ticked all compliance boxes, making them more vulnerable. 2018, government started a process of validating NGOs. What government was really doing is asking NGOs to bring back the documents that government had given them to put them on the validation list. The first validation list was released in, I think, around August 2019 by the Minister of Internal Affairs. The minister made a statement and said, anyone who is not on this list is out there illegally. Now, you have a situation where NGOs have valid 
licenses, valid permits, valid uh, certificates of operation, probably meeting everything, but have not just made a copy of those very documents to give them to the minister or to the NGO bureau. And the minister is saying, if you didn't do this, you are illegal. So the minister issues a statement with around, I think, 2,000 NGOs, while the NGO bureau database was saying we had 12,000 NGOs. So in effect, the minister is indirectly deregistering through a press statement around 10,000 NGOs and called on in RDCs and whoever, hotels, whoever, police to arrest anyone who is doing that. Of course, no arrests happened, but uh, a number of NGOs could not work, would go to the communities and they tell them, since you are not on this list, uh, you are illegal. So that list, since then, that list is updated on a weekly basis. So you have that kind of control, like every week there is a new list where you might be or you may not be. Sara Bidete is the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance, CCG. She says government uses its legal and policy framework to manage and control NGOs. She takes us on the barrage of laws that Uganda has drafted to control civil society. Civic space in Uganda is closing. As much as we have Article 29 of the Constitution that provides for freedom of assembly, association, expression, conscience, uh, among others, academia and, and other freedoms of expression, we have 15 laws that contradict Article 29 of the Constitution. Among these laws is the Public Order Management Act, Computer Misuse Act, Interception of Communications Act, uh, uh, Anti-Terrorism Act, Anti-Money Laundering Act, the NGO Act, the Press and Freedoms Act, the UCC Act, Uganda Communications Commission Act. All these laws have components that contradict Article 29 of the Constitution, freedoms as listed by the UN and recognized worldwide. Of all these, the government's strongest legal tool is the Anti-Money Laundering Act 2013 and the NGO Act of 2016. We have laws like the NGO Act. It has uh, sections that we are challenging in the Constitutional Court, Center for Constitutional Governance and Chapter 4 are the petitioners, including Article 44, which is vague, which says that NGOs cannot take sides in a political activity. So we want court to define for us who are NGOs? Because NGOs are legal entities, they are not persons. So when you have a law that hides behind such vagueness, this clause can be used against NGO leaders. There's a difference between NGOs and NGO leaders. So we want a pronouncement. When you are saying NGOs, are you saying CCG as a legal entity? Or you are talking about who works for CCG? And if you are taking away my rights to politically identify with, with people of my choice, how about the political parties and, uh, and organizations act, which only limits public servants? And it's very clear in Art section 16. It says people who are prohibited from taking sides in political activities are members of the prison service. Uganda People's Defense Forces, Uganda Police Force, and any other person working for an organization that is fully controlled by government. Those are the people who are prohibited from being partisan. So when you smuggle this clause in the NGO Act, first of all, what, what do you mean that NGOs cannot take sides? Who are NGOs? That's the first question we want the Constitutional Court to interpret. Two, if that is aimed at NGO leaders, then doesn't it contradict Article 38 of the Constitution, which says citizens are free to participate in their, in the gov in their affairs, either through civic or political organizations. And uh, the lawmaking process had a bit of divide and rule. I remember 
the later Ronda, who was Minister of Internal Affairs, telling um, uh, religious leaders that you see NGOs promote um, foreign interests, they promote homosexuality, they promote immoral things in this country. So let's make a law that helps me control them, that those were his words. And I will make a special law for you, the religious leaders. So the religious leaders really supported the law to control NGOs because in the eyes of government then was that NGOs promote immorality, um, homosexuality, sex workers, name it. And so the law was made with the, that kind of background. The present uh, NGO, uh, the NGO Act of 2016. Birete had no kind words for the NGO Bureau for closing NGOs. Compliance is double-sided. There is compliance on the side of government and there is compliance on the side of the, of the sector. So as government people talk about compliance, they need to ask themselves, are they compliant? And if you are not compliant, if you are not fully constituted, what moral authority do you have to point at other people that they are not compliant? So we have a board, a secretariat that is operating to meet my concern. No supervision, no control, and taking draconian decisions. Among the decisions that the board took was an attempt to regulate entities that are not registered under the Bureau. You are a bureau, people are supposed to come and register with you and you license them. She says that the NGO board is supposed to support NGOs and not only to police them. Of course, we are, civil society is under attack by the regime. And for two reasons. One is that the regime wants to control the operations of civil society. But the constitution, under the democratic principles and Article 38 gives civil society autonomy to determine their objectives and autonomy to pursue their objectives. But the government wants to alter this autonomy of NGOs. So they have, I'm sure they have scared many people who would have wished to join this volunteer space because this is volunteerism. Many people who would have wished to form NGOs, I'm sure they are thinking twice. Bireta says that if government continues to shrink the civic space, the worst could happen. In the run-up to independence, there were attempts to silence the likes of Musasiza and others. But when they were banned from open engagements, they went underground and even caused more havoc. At times, closure, Can, can make the people more aggressive. And when they go underground, you are not even capable of knowing what they are doing. So I think government should stick to their function of regulation, other than pushing citizens to go underground and do more aggressive acts. Civil society will always exist in Uganda, and citizens will always engage in their governance including holding leaders accountable. They will. You can close NGOs, you can close offices, but you cannot close citizens. Citizenship is an inherent right. And no state can take it away. Now, the place at which we are as Uganda, is we have never had a transition, a peaceful transition of power, never. We have always had wars and our mindset, you imagine what is happening in Ukraine, turns round and it's happening in Uganda. But it is bound to happen if we do not live by the principles of democracy, if we cannot push for democratic principles. Every time people to go to elections, people go to polls, people participate in governance, and you push them away. You gag them. You stop them from speaking. You are causing bottling up of anger. 
every time there is no tolerance, then you're killing a state, you're killing a nation. That is what Amin did. Amin didn't have tolerance. He rejected tolerance. Police is at the center of this shrinking civil space, says Professor Gerald Kareja, a political analyst and an expert on good governance. Emphasizing the rule of law, emphasizing rights, emphasizing empowering citizens to hold the state to account makes the state uncomfortable. Even if people say, ah, NGOs are doing better than the state, the state will still say, well, they are supplementing us. After all, we've given them permission to work with us. So it can tolerate the competition, so to say, but not the questioning, but not the undermining of its legitimacy. The government viewed NGOs as a major threat because of their ability to mobilize masses. Professor Kareja opines. From different writings and stories we hear from those that were in uh, the struggle, or the, they call it the Bush War, a number of NGOs and non-state actors like the church we are very active in enabling them to do their work. How? Through disguise, through fearing of arms, through giving them cover. One, one of, at the church has been mentioned severally. Red Cross has been mentioned. Those who are in power now know the potential of the civil society to either mobilize those that are against the state and support them, or demobilize the, the, those who are in power. And because of that, the state becomes very sensitive. That's why for a long time on the NGO board, the deputy chairperson of the NGO board was from security, and particularly internal security. That was deliberate. To. For any mobilization to happen, there is need for funding and resources. Museveni's government knew this well. Through his political lens, Professor Kareja says the government did not spare those that had budgets to do any work in promoting democracy and the rule of law. Access to foreign funding for civil society organizations has become difficult due to government restriction. Some foreign-funded CSOs are labeled as threats to national sovereignty through interference in domestic affairs by outside interests. You'll have uh, government and the rest telling you how NGOs are promoting the political side. I remember when I was working on oil and gas and the oil and gas laws, every other day we were told how we are promoting uh, foreign interests because we, we had proposed particular things to be included in the oil and gas laws. Some of them actually, the present amendments are picking exactly what we had proposed. And sometimes it's government people trying to hide probably their loot, so they have to give a bad name to this person who is uh, having the evidence. In February 2021, President Museveni silenced the heartbeat of many civil society organizations by ordering a shutdown of the Democratic Governance Facility, a central basket for funding worth 100 million euros from EU member states. While DGF was funding so many government entities including the justice, law and order sector, a section of its funding was channeled to over 100 NGOs to support their oversight work. DGF funding supported efforts to strengthen civil society organizations in advocacy, improve their organizational capacity, and promote an enabling environment for civil society to contribute to development. In a letter sent to the Finance Minister Matia Kasaija, Museveni cautions the motive behind the DGF funding. How is it possible that the Ugandans, whose affairs are being dealt with here, can only be spectators in the management of their own affairs? This is not the financing of a private business, but the funding of state and non-state actors to achieve the political objective of the funders, he asked. Consequently, in December 2022, DGF exited the market, affecting the operations of many civil society organizations. The Democratic Governance Facility was the major funder for civic activities in Uganda. Many people have run out of funding, Many people have switched jobs 
because of uncertainty? You'll just see a police vehicle written on jealous, support from jealous, which came from <laughs> DGF. They know all that, but they are not, they are worried that maybe the money that you are funding iPod or you are funding uh, these other entities might be going to the opposition. That's the only problem that they might be having, even if they don't mention it. This, however, did not come as a surprise to Professor Kariesha. In 2006, when the multi-party political dispensation was ushered, development agencies turned to NGOs as a dependable force for cultivating citizen engagement to promote political accountability and to deepen democratic governance in Uganda. Indeed, as financial aid increased towards promoting good governance agenda in Uganda, so did the number of NGOs that became increasingly focused on good governance, rule of law, and human rights. This, according to Professor Kariesha, was discomforting for the state. So when a number of protest notes are written to the foreign affairs, to the state, then they try to find out who are these people working with. So all these try to, to make some people in power uncomfortable, and one of the ways to react is to either want to control, to censure, minimize, or even stop the activities of those who bring those things to the fore. Even in our local languages, we have things like According to Professor Kariesha, the shrinking civic space spells doom for government. It makes uh, the state fragile. Because you see, the construction of democracy is built on, on mutual suspicion. And that's why there has to be rule of law. When you have that shrinking space, it doesn't move alone in terms of civil society. It moves with the other aspects of what we call substantive democracy. And the issues of substantive democracy go with the issues of rule of law, issues of human rights, issues of uh, accountability. Professor Kariesha's message could be falling on deaf ears as government continues to draft laws that suffocate the freedom of speech and expression. But what could be the dangers if this space is closed out? Civil society is among the biggest employers. We have high rates of unemployment. You are causing uncertainty even on the job opportunities that would have been there for, for citizens. I'm sure part of the tax the tax collection shortfalls. It includes the shrinking civic space. During COVID, I know it was very difficult, but the government had to admit that NGOs were the only stabilizing factor for our foreign exchange earnings. So the contribution of NGOs cannot be wished away. Society then would cease to be there, and when civil society ceases to be there, the citizen's voice is choked. When the citizen's voice is choked, the citizen begins to use unconventional means of being heard. More pigs will be thrown, there will be more violence, there will be more anger, like I have told you. And eventually, they will be looking for AK-47, those who have run out of Moroto prisons, what have they done? They kill cows and do all these things and whatever. Because they are looking for a way of, how do you hear me? I'm also down here. People don't have food, Solomon. But as the civic space continues to shrink, many in the advocacy space have turned to online campaigns. This too is just a sign of relief. But as far as the civil society organizations are concerned, they are choking, they are stifling the activities of civil society because there is nothing that civil society organizations do not declare to the NGO Bureau. Everything is declared. All the documents you asked to submit to the NGO Bureau Go with your vision, your mission, and your mandate, what you want to do within the country. Uganda is by all means a growing democracy. Civil society has a critical role to play in enhancing citizen participation in governance processes and in the rule of law. But the current legal and policy framework is by far restricting these efforts, further shrinking civic space and the operations of civil society. As many donors leave the country, and others redirecting funding resources to other sectors, the future of civil society in Uganda is blurry if the state is not brought to an understanding on the role that CSOs play in supporting government to achieve its development agenda.